Tired of doing investment research on stock markets? Wants to go for a walk outside the house with a friend? Introducing iCapital, where you can get investment advice on the go. It is accessible via app and website. Subscribe now to iCapital for stock news. iCapital is reliable because they thoroughly research listed companies, economies, and stock markets. iCapital provides a clear perspective of how markets interact and how it influences your investment. When investors and traders are debating whether to buy or sell their stocks, fret not as iCapital will recommend Malaysian and global stocks. iCapital is available on Apple App Store, Google Play Store and Huawei App Gallery. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, Teng Bu again from Capital Dynamics. And uh, I hope you have had uh, a good week and uh, you have a good weekend as well. Today, the topic is going to be about the ringgit. The ringgit, the ringgit, the ringgit. And we hope that this will be our last video on the ringgit. Why? I think this thing about ringgit is really trending, you know, in the traditional media, social media everywhere. Uh, people are talking about the, 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 this, the ringgit. Unfortunately, a lot of the comments uh, that I hear, that I read, that I see, a lot of them are, I wouldn't call it hype, but many of the comments are, I think, from worries and fears. People seem to have a little bit of panic as to what is going to happen next. And... Then there are also quite a number of economists, so to speak, who have commented and given their views, possibly adding to the confusion. And of course, there are politicians. Some of the comments are very politically driven. And I think at the end of the day, the person in the street, the man, the woman in the street, it's even more confused. So what I hope to do today is to maybe make it a bit clearer and then also to ease some of the worries and the fears that some of you may have and who knows, like I said, by end of the year maybe people would have forgotten about the ringgit because by then maybe the ringgit would be either stabilized or perform better and as our title has clearly uh, pointed out we hope it will be the last video our last video on the ringgit we have done three videos in june last year 10th june 16th june 17th june and if you add up the three uh, videos on the ringgit i think we possibly have gotten i don't know 150,000 views thousands of comments i would don't want to repeat what has been said you can go back do a search and look at our youtube channel 10 of june 16 of june 17 of june where we have discussed this topic about the ringgit in great detail and a lot of what we have said, in fact, all of what we have said are based on economic analysis. It is not from a political angle. It is not just from a man in the street. I'm trained as an economist. My degree is in economics. And for those of you who still think that uh, possibly I'm not qualified to speak, well, I think my Almost 50 years of experience with the financial markets have given me insights that maybe others may not possess. And also, uh, if you want a bit more credibility, I'm also an adjunct professor at the Sydney University of Technology, UTS. So I would want to approach this without the hype, without any political agenda, and based on um, economic analysis. 
and facts. So let's dive into the topic again. The first chart I want to share with you is the exchange rate of Sing dollar against the ringgit, right? The ringgit. This over the last five years, and as you can see, in that five-year period, uh, the ringgit, the Sing dollar has appreciated about seventeen percent against the ringgit, right? So then you say, here you go. That's why we're so worried because the ringgit seems to be falling against the Sing dollar. Calm down, calm down. Let let that facts take over. As Chairman Mao would love to say, as Ting Xiaoping would love to say, seek truth from facts, not from your could I copy gossip, not from your political leader, your politician, or from people who claim to be gurus of all kinds. Let's take a look at the second diagram. This is Sing dollar against Australian dollar. Same five-year period up to 1st of March. And guess what? Singapore dollar has gained about 9.8% against the AUD. Right? Next. This is against Indonesian rupiah. Same five-year period. Sing dollar appreciated about 12%. Next. Sing dollar against Thai baht. Five-year period, 13.7 more or less. Next. Sing dollar against Indian rupee. I mean, the Indian economy is supposed to be hot, right? The Mumbai Stock Exchange is at all-time high. And here you have the Indian rupee over the last five years dropping about 17 point, about the same as Malaysian ringgit. So, what's the big deal? Next. More importantly, Sing dollar has appreciated 19% against the Korean one. In other words, the Korean one against the ringgit has performed worse than the ringgit. Sorry, Korean one against Sing dollar has performed worse than the ringgit against the Sing dollar. And let me share with you the next one. The Japanese yen. In that five year period, Sing dollar has strengthened 35.2% against the yen. Wow. Something must be wrong with the Japanese currency. Right? So what I'm trying to show, share with you here is what is happening to the ringgit is not just happening to the ringgit. It's just that the Sing dollar is so strong, the Singapore dollar is so strong that it has even strengthened against the US dollar. And let's take a look at the next chart. This is ringgit against Sing dollar from 1981. If you see that, 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 that the line, the ringgit has been weakening against the Singapore dollar for 40 over years. And when did the current government come into power? Uh, about 13, 14 months ago, I think, about end of 2022. So I've circled for you in that chart where the current government is. So as since the time the current government has come in, the ringgit has weakened from about 3.1, 3.15 to about 3.4, 3.5. But what about the last 40 odd years? In 1981, the ringgit was 1 to 1 against the Sing dollar. So why hasn't something been done? If you want to do something about the ringgit, it should have been, the action should have been taken 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So don't just focus on the last 12 months. That's not correct. It's not fair. And more importantly, if you focus just on that, it will not help the country. It will not help the government formulate the correct policies to address this type of issues. Let's take a look at ringgit against USD from 1990. I circled the part where uh, it's the last 14-15 uh, months of the current government. So in that time, it has moved from about 4.4 to about 4.7, 8%. And 
I mean, come on, at 4.7, 4.9, it hit the same level or more or less of why the ringgit was in 1997, 1998. So actually, the performance of the ringgit has been weak for a long time. And, you know, if Malaysians want to do something, want to really make a huge, big outcry about where the ringgit is going, it should have been done 30 years, 40 years ago. It should have been done when the fourth Prime Minister was in. Anyway, I don't want to go down politics. I'm just showing you the facts that the situation that the ringgit is facing now cannot be solved in just a few months, a few quarters. Because we have not solved this issue for the last 40 years. And you expect it to be solved in a few months, I think that is really a fairy tale. I don't believe in fairy tales. As I mentioned in my past sessions, the exchange rates of any country, of any currency, are determined by two types of factors. One is shorter term, the other one is longer term. One is cyclical, one is structural. The shorter term are the cyclical type, the longer term are the structural factors. So what has happened in the last, if you look at, for example, this diagram of the ringgit against the USD from say 2021 to 2024 now is, as I've explained before, due to short-term cyclical factors. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at the next diagram. I've shown this before, again, it's the US federal funds rate, which is the short-term policy rate, and our Malaysia's overnight policy rate, the one that Bank Negara controls and manages. The federal funds rate is managed and controlled by the US Federal Reserve. So you see the thick black line in the middle, that is the difference between the US federal funds, funds rate and Malaysia's OPR. And as this diagram, this chart shows you clearly the interest rate differential between the two economies is at its widest since, well, since 2009. It's about almost getting to about 2.5, 2.7%. And that's because the US federal funds rate has been aggressively raised by the Federal Reserve to control an inflation situation in US which was getting out of control to bring it down to a 2% target level. In the case of Malaysia, we raised our OPR, but a lot less. The line in blue is Malaysia's OPR, overnight policy rate, right? And we are still at 3%. So because the federal funds rate has gone up a lot more in a shorter span of time compared with our OPR, the interest rate differential has widened. And because of that, that has an impact on exchange rate. I mean, you would imagine if I put a short-term uh, deposit money market in a ringgit, I only get about 3%. But if I put in a shorter-term money market in US or even a, more importantly for a, a two-year government bond, I get 4%, 5%. I earn much higher interest rate there. And that is the reason why, one reason why from a cyclical point of view, the US dollar has been so strong and currencies, especially for emerging countries like Malaysia, has been affected. So this US uh, ringgit exchange rate from a short-term point of view has been affected greatly by interest rate differential. But look, this interest rate differential will, 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 will swing another, another direction. If you look at the same chart again, you'll notice that previously uh, Malaysia's OPR was higher than the US funds rate when the US was the economy was doing badly, there was no inflation, growth was weak, labor market was weak, so the US federal funds 
was kept at zero, zero, for many, many years. And at that time, the interest rate differential was in favor of the ringgit. So I, at this level, from a shorter term point of view, I'm not particularly concerned because the markets will adjust itself when the fundamentals, when the shorter term fundamentals change. The more important one would be structural factors. Let's take a look at the next diagram, which I again have explained in the past. For exchange rate determination, current account surplus or deficit is one of the most important variables to look at, particularly for developing countries. If you are a developed country, you know, there's a bias. In, in a lot of things in our life, there's a bias against developing country. In the same thing happens in Forex, in the foreign exchange market. If you have a current account deficit, which Australia has, US has, it's okay, you know, you're a developed country. So the perception is different. Of course, the other reasons why uh, a current account deficit for a country like US may not matter so much. For example, to a country like Malaysia, right? Not only is Malaysia a developing country, but the economy is extremely open. In other words, import and export forms a big part of the G In fact, not only do they form a big part of GDP, export-import is bigger than our GDP. Whereas in the case of America, export-import forms a much smaller part of the economy. So there are many factors uh, involved. But I just want to highlight that for developing country, we are here, we are concerned with Malaysia. Current account surplus or deficit is an important driver of long-term exchange rate trends. Now you see there are two charts here. One is from 2010 to 2023 fourth quarter. That is on a quarterly basis. So if you look at the last quarter of 2023, we are, Malaysia is still in a surplus, but it has dropped pretty significantly, right? And if you look at the larger chart where we did a big circle for you to show you that this is where we are in the last 10, 15 years, Malaysia has been enjoying current account surplus compared with 1980 to 1996. The triangle, the, sorry, the rectangle in blue with the dashed line is where Malaysia experienced consistently huge current account deficit. That is the time when we should have tackled our deficit. That is the time that was setting the root cause of the weakening of the ringgit. But we didn't do anything, unfortunately, until 1998. So I want to bring you all back to long term versus short term, cyclical versus structural. So the structural factors here uh, still, I wouldn't say it's the strongest. I mean, if our current account surplus is at 3 to 5%, that would be better. But nevertheless, a surplus is still a surplus. More importantly, you may ask, what will happen in 2024, 2025? Will we swing to current account deficit or will we still have surplus or even a higher surplus? Okay, now I'm coming back to shorter term factors. Right? This is where maybe we have something a bit more positive to say. But before that, I just want to share with you the comments of an economist from the World Bank so that you can understand that what I'm saying is not just taking something from the sky, but it is based on sound economic theory. Can we share the views? This was, I think, about a week ago. The economist, uh, the World Bank economist, Apuva Sangi, said that the ringgit's poor performance is due to the lack of competitiveness in Malaysia over the last 28 years. Now, when, you, when a country like Malaysia has lack of competitiveness, it will show in many ways, right? And he says that weak ringgit is ultimately a symptom of long-term decline in Malaysia's competitiveness, a point which I agree with, a point that we have also made over many, many, many times in the last 10, 15 years. 
On the right side, you see Apuva said that while many Asian countries also slipped following the 1998 financial crisis, Malaysia's lack of reform affected its economy in the long run. He added that Malaysia opted for short-term solution, political short-term solution, right, to boost the ringgit in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. Short-term solutions like capital control. This, however, consequently hurt the ringgit in the long run, adding that the Malaysian government measures resulted in its GDP and exports falling. I mean, it, the article is a bit longer, but I'm just bringing out the main points. And you talk to any serious economist who knows the history, who knows the facts of the country, they tell you the same thing. And I mentioned in my previous videos that after the 1997 crisis, Thailand reform, South Korea reform, Singapore reform, Indonesia reform, Malaysia, no. Malaysia was just like business as usual policy. What Malaysia did was a year and a half after the ringgit plunge, can we go back the ringgit chart? Okay, right. When did we impose capital control? When it was really too late. When the money, when the foreign funds have all left the country, left the economy, then only you impose capital control. And one day after you impose capital control, you sack your deputy prime minister. So the capital control was a political move, not an economic move. Because if you wanted to do capital control, you should have done it in 1997, not in 1998. And you impose capital control, fine. What reforms did you do? Nothing. That is why Malaysians don't realize. That's why we need, you know, the regulators and all that love to talk about improving financial literacy of our people, you know, how to save, how to invest and all that. But at Capital Dynamics, we have been saying, what is more important for you, for the country as a whole, is economic literacy. Ordinary Malaysians, voters, people who vote, the parties and the political leaders must be able to understand economics. Otherwise, your bluff, your hoodwink by all kinds of people. So in this case here, in the case of currency and Malaysian ringgit and the 1997 crisis, you look across Thailand, South Korea, Indonesia, all of them reform except Malaysia. And why is it that now we're suffering this? So, can we go back to the comments by the World Bank? Look, like I said, the World Bank has no political agenda. I have no political agenda. So, if you want, you can go and read up on this kind of materials. They're found, easily found on the internet. right? But please make sure you read sources that are credible, that don't have an ulterior motive. And improve your economic literacy because by doing that, you can help the country in getting better political leaders elected, in getting better economic policies implemented. Right? And therefore, in the long run, you help the ringgit. That's all link. And if you think that economic literacy is something meant for economic professors, you're very wrong. So let's go to the shorter term scenario and where I can give you some maybe not so bad news. This is Malaysia's real GDP up to fourth quarter. Uh, 2023, if you look at the last quarter, I don't have a pointer, but you can see on the right hand side, right? There's a column which is colored red with dot dot dot, dot inside. That is to show you net exports. In other words, Malaysia's export minus import. So the external sector of the Malaysian economy in the fourth quarter and the third quarter was very weak. 
they were contributing negatively to Malaysia's GDP and therefore Malaysia's GDP's growth rate slowed down quite a lot. But I think that is in the past. I think going forward, we should have something more optimistic. Can we take a look? This is the export growth rate of Malaysia, China, Korea, South Korea and Singapore. And Malaysia export growth is the thick black line. And I show the other countries to show that the decline in Malaysia's export is not confined to just Malaysia. If you look at the other countries, these are South Korea, Singapore, China are major exporters as well. So they all decline. More or less, the trend is more or less the same. And what is more important is exports are now recovering. If you look at Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, China's export figures haven't been released because the Chinese New Year affects export figures in January and February of every year. So they were released on a joint basis. But Malaysia, South Korea and Singapore by January has gone into positive. In fact, Malaysia's export growth in January was about 8, 8.5%. So you can see the recovery coming back, which means what? Which means that should this continue to sustain, our current account surplus should improve again. And that should strengthen the fundamental situation of the ringgit. Next. What is important is that malicious exports are very closely tied to those of the E&E &E industry. What is E&E? &E? Electronics and electrical. The red line is E&E. &E. The blue line is Malaysia's total exports. As you can see, they are like, are they brother? They are like twin brothers. They go up and down, up and down together. And within E&E, &E, uh, semiconductors, the, the, the sales of semiconductors, the upper semiconductors are very important. Next. So here to show you how important E&E &E exports are as a percentage of Malaysia's total exports, as a percentage is not in absolute terms and in percentage terms, E and E exports has been growing pretty strongly. And as I mentioned, the major item within this sector is semiconductors. Next, the semiconductor global semiconductor sales are very cyclical. So what has happened was 2022, 2023 semiconductor sales declined globally but they have really been recovering. So the recovery will continue, driven by a few things. Uh, the decline was driven by decline in computers and smartphones. Smartphone, sales of smartphones and computers have bottomed out and should be recovering. Now it is more the EV side and the data centers, which is cloud computing and AI. So if you look at the next two years, semiconductor sales globally will improve and therefore, Malaysia's exports will improve and therefore our current account surplus should improve and that should give a solid footing for the ringgit. The other important factor for Malaysia's exports will be the China's, China's economy. A lot of people say that, well, you know, if you read the Western media, the Chinese economy is dead, it's past its peak, it's never going to come back. As I've said in the past, don't read media which is bullshit. Read things which gives you objective facts and figures. Next. Let me just show you one. China's real GDP on an annual basis is in red. Japan is blue. EU is uh, black. US is green. 2019, before pandemic, China was the fastest. In 2020, Japan, EU, US were all in recession, China had 2 plus percent GDP, 2021, 2022, even in 2023, when you read the Western media that says that the Chinese property market is so down, the Chinese uh, consumption is down, the Chinese stock market is down, blah, 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 everything is down. But why is it that China's GDP in 2023 expanded at 5.3% and the US only slightly above 2%? EU is almost in recession and Japan cannot even reach 2%. So why is it that in that five years, the China's real GDP grew more strongly than all the others? I didn't invent these facts. These facts are all from official statistics sources. 
And why is China important to Malaysia? Next. Because in terms of export destination, China is extremely important for Malaysia. Singapore is the largest destination. China is next, US, and so on and so forth, Hong Kong. But don't look at these figures superficially because in Singapore, a lot of the Malaysia export that go to Singapore will go to third countries. Singapore's economy cannot absorb so much. It has to be transshipped and redirected to other countries. So a lot of the Singapore exports go to China. Same thing for Hong Kong. Look at Thailand, South Korea, Vietnam, Australia. These are economies that rely substantially on the Chinese economy. 40%, 35 to 40% of Australia's exports go to one country, China. 40%. So what we're showing you is that Malaysia's exports rely a lot on the Chinese economy. And the Chinese economy in 2024 will be stronger than in 2023. And in 2025, the Chinese economy will be better than 2024. So Malaysia will be a beneficiary. Right? The other positive thing that we can look at is, next, tourist arrivals. Uh, this is up to December. As the diagram shows you, our the number of tourists that's coming to Malaysia is still below the pre-pandemic peak. We still got a long, still got a bit of way to go, but it has recovered strongly. And what is more important is in this recovery, the Chinese tourists have not really come in yet. It has been driven by other markets. So what is this figure is telling you is that as the Chinese economy gains solid footing, as the Chinese consumers become more confident, they will travel more. So tourist arrivals from Malaysia, just from China alone, is going to improve in 2024, 2025. I'm not worried about that. I'm only worried whether our KLIA is ready. Our KL International Airport, in the recent, in one of the studies, was ranked as one of the worst airports in the world. I totally agree with that. Because we still don't have Aerotrain. And I'm still looking for the pharmacy in KLIA. And if you come in, I mean, I travel frequently, I use KLIA frequently. If you look at the immigration counters, the queues for the foreigners is so long. So I'm not worried about the Chinese tourists coming because now we've got visa-free arrangement. I'm only worried as to whether Malaysia as a country we are ready to have more of the necessary spending to boost the Malaysian economy. So, I think overall, in terms of uh, exports, Malaysia should do better this year, next year. That will lead to better current account surplus. And at the same time, the US interest rates have, should be peaking. Right. What can happen to the US will be a few things. Either the inflation rate suddenly bounces back more strongly than what the US Federal Reserve expected. Should that happen, the US Federal Reserve has no choice but to increase interest rate, the US market will crash. The US market crash is good for developing countries like Malaysia, the US, if the central bank increase interest rate one or two more times, that will be the end because after that, the US will go into recession. When the US goes into recession, when the US stock market crash, what does the Federal Reserve do? They slash interest rate. They don't cut, they slash, you know, slash. In the pandemic, US interest rates went to zero in about two or three months. So should the US market crash, and the US goes into recession, or the inflation doesn't worsen anymore, you can expect US interest rates to have peak and to fall. Now, whether it falls slowly or aggressively, that depends on US inflation, that depends on uh, whether the stock market crashes or not. But whatever it is, the outcome is, it is positive for the interest rate differential. Remember, I was telling you, 
the differential between Malaysia's interest rate and US interest rate is very high. So once that starts to narrow and the currency traders would also expect it to narrow further, then the ringgit will strengthen. So I think, I hope I've given you some crucial facts, right? some forecasts, what I see coming in the next one to two years. And I think just relax, enjoy, go and drink your kopi o, go and have your tetare, don't worry about the ringgit. Make sure that you work hard, work hard, and then boost the economy, boost our exports. And when we have the tourists coming, treat them well, welcome them, make sure that they will love to come back to Malaysia again, which I'm sure they will. Everything's going to be fine. And then give the current government some time to come out. They still haven't come out with solid long-term economic policy. I'm still waiting. Right? They cannot take too long because the window of opportunity doesn't last forever. There's a limited window of opportunity that the current government must make use of, which means reform, reform, reform. Or even better still, better than reform, is transformation, transform the Malaysian economy. And I hope, I really hope that the current government is capable and competent enough to do that. Because I also want the ringgit to strengthen or at least stabilize. With that, I hope you have a good weekend. Uh, in the weekend, I'll be traveling. I'll be going to Kuantan. I'll be having uh, a few talks in Kuantan. And I would imagine that uh, people will be asking me the same question in Kuantan as well, what happens to the ringgit? So, like I said at the beginning, I hope that this will be our last video on the ringgit. And the next video on the ringgit will be, hey, why did the ringgit strengthen? Share our uh, YouTube, like our YouTube, because the more you can share, the more you can spread this type of uh, recordings where there's no political agenda, where there's no kind of hypes, no kind of fabricated news. People would learn, people would get educated, and then the panic would subside. Because you cannot also eliminate the fact that exchange rates are determined by psychological factors, people's behavior, whether they're panicking or they are still calm, it helps. So, thank you again and uh, have a good weekend.